Hello, everyone, and welcome to Live with the Pricing Lady. I'm Janine Liston, your hostess, and this is episode 100. Yay! <laughs> so we have been working our way towards episode 100 for the past two months, celebrating with retrosodes. And then last time we had a very special panel of previous guests and listeners. And today I've invited my colleague and friend, Paulina Rossi, here to interview me. So we're going to be turning the tables and looking behind the scenes at both the podcast and the business. Now, before we get started, if you have not listened to the show before, it is all about the topic of pricing. I work with small business owners, startups, and entrepreneurs to help them be more confident about what they charge because they understand the value of their offer and charge for it. This helps them to be more sustainably sustainably profitable and be there for their clients serving them well into the future. So welcome everyone and welcome to my interviewer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Janine. Hi, and lovely to be on the show again in, on this side of a table. Yes. Very exciting. That's I'm right. She's excited. also been a guest. <laughs> nice. Is that correct? Once. 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 Ah, okay. Okay, very good. So I'll turn the tables to you, Paulina. And oh, before I do that, hello to everybody who's listening. Uh, we are live streaming on LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube. As we go through, if you have questions or comments, be sure to share them with us. All right, Paulina, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And a warm welcome to everybody who's listening to us live. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. And thank you again, Janine, for inviting me to interview you. And as you have such a great and entertaining show, I was thinking we could start start off the same way you're starting with your guests with a few rapid fire mm -hmm. questions to get us all warmed up and maybe show a little bit of a different side of you for your audience as well. Yes. So where are you from, Janine? Yes, so I am joining today from Basel, Switzerland. I've lived here for about 21 years. I grew up, however, in Sacramento, California. Beautiful. And what is your superpower? So my superpower, I would say, is helping people have aha moments. Uh, this comes in many different contexts, but I've always found that I'm able to explain either technical things or things that people find difficult um, in ways that they can relate to and understand very easily. And it's the same when it comes to pricing. A lot of people come to me because they don't know where to go and what to do and feel that it's a very difficult topic. And I can help make that topic more easy, easily understandable and help them figure out how to use it. That's a superpower many of us could, could benefit from. <laughs> but then how about you? What is one interesting thing that people don't maybe know about you yet after having listened to you for 100 episodes? Well, oh, 99 yeah. and a little bit over 100. <laughs> There's so many different things. One of the things that a lot of people don't know about me is that I make my own greeting cards. So I've been doing this for well before I came to Switzerland, so probably about 25 years at least. Um, and I use, you know, paper crafts and stamps and paints and different things to make my own greeting cards. And I, I was I, in the past, I've always referred it to, to it as my girly hobby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's interesting. A nice, nice uh, way to balance out the more technical, technical aspects of your work. Mm -hmm. Well, let's dive in, shall we? Okay. And often when we look at other people and other entrepreneurs, it's always so easy to look at them and say that, oh, she's so good at pricing and she's got it all figured out. But when we look a little bit deeper or when we look at look at look behind the scenes, we mm -hmm. often see see that they built it up, they grew into that, and they weren't born like that. That. And you you didn't start with pricing either, did you? You started with something completely different. That's very true. Very true. Yes. Yeah. So I started my career as a structural engineer, uh, designing buildings. And I would practice. I studied that in university and then practiced for about three and a half years. So if you find yourself in uh, Western Connecticut and the parts of New York right around there, there's... Um, several buildings around there that I designed. And uh, as far as I know, they're all still standing, which is the main objective of a structural engineer. <laughs> That's 
bad. That's not bad. Did you ever go there to just uh, admire them? No. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, from time to time, some of them, and I still have a lot of friends over there. So uh, when I go visit people over there, then I drive by them. I was like, oh yeah, it's still standing. <laughs> <laughs> A lot like your clients who's pricing you help uh, help them fix so, so that they can stand, <laughs> stand tall for the decades to come. Yeah, well, I mean, when it comes to my pricing clients, there is nothing more exciting for me than hearing about their success. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes I see it through social media. Sometimes I hear from them directly, but it just, it makes me feel so happy for them when, when I see that they're able to, you know, this is about that aha moment. You kind of make that transformation from, I'm not sure how to do this or I can't to being able to. Yeah. Well, what, what happened? What made an engineer become a pricing expert? <laughs> well, really, it was it was sort of just a happenstance to some extent. So when I left uh, my engineering job, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I was just trying to figure out, okay, how can I uh, pay my bills and support myself while I figure this out? And I got a job with a, a company as a technical writer and an admin assistant thinking that I would just be there for, you know, a year or so until I figured out what was next and move on. And uh, lo and behold, I ended up there being there for eight years. I worked my way into product management, uh, what we called applications engineering, and as the head of applications engineering and, and marketing. And it's also with that company that came to Switzerland. Uh, and that was also my first then exposure to pricing. Uh, we had no formal pricing function in the company, a relatively small company. Uh, but of course, as a product manager, pricing was one of the responsibilities that I had. And many of you, if you've listened to episodes uh, where I've been interviewed before, you'll know that one of the first things I did was hand me a price list and it was 20 years old. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I had, at the time, I had very little commercial background, but I knew enough to know that there was something wrong with that. Um, and so the first thing I did was actually restructure the pricing for my portfolio and then for other parts of, of the business as well. And that was really my first step into the topic. But it wasn't until years later when I moved to Switzerland that I actually took a job as a pricing manager. Uh, when and you when you started working on that pricing a price list that was 20 years old and started thinking about all the all the aspects uh, that come with pricing was it love at first sight so you know a lot of times so in a way in a way yes in a way i'm not sure what i can say is that my brain is hardwired to solve problems <laughs> Hence the engineering. I don't know if it, that was the first or if that was if that was how I got into engineering or an outcome of studying engineering or both. Right. Uh, but, you know, I, I see a problem and it's my instinct to try and find a solution for that. Um, and the problem that we were having was that offers were not getting out the door as quickly as they could. And part of the problem was we were reinventing the wheel every time we priced something. We were the part of the company I was working in was a, we were working on large multi-dollar system, multi-million dollar systems. And there's a lot between when you send the first offer out and when you close a deal and, and such things. And the sooner you can get that first offer out the door, the sooner you can start the rest of the process. And so for me, it taking one to two weeks to get the offer out the door was just silliness. Yeah. And, and so that was one of the reasons that I started working on the pricing for my product line. I was like, we got to speed this up so that we can get, you know, we can get off the starting line quicker is basically what it was. Absolutely. And well, uh, being an entrepreneur myself, I can definitely relate. And I'm sure many of our listen listeners can yeah. because it's it's a huge project to get an offer out the door. But at the same time, especially if you have a service based business, you have m many other things to do as well. So you don't yeah. want to spend days and weeks on that. So it's very helpful to have that kind of clear yeah. structure and strategy behind that. Yeah. And then we have Megan listening to us. Megan listening. Yes. <laughs> Congratulating. Thanks. Thanks for following. Let us know if you have any questions you would like to ask Janine. This is this is yes. the day and the, the place to do that. Yes. Hi, Megan. Hi, Ramona. Hello, the rest of you. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, there's someone as well. Lovely, lovely to see the comments coming in. Yeah. Uh, when I listen to you, I keep thinking that there's oh, there are a lot of commonalities between pricing and engineering. Is do you agree? <sighs> Good question. I mean, in some ways there are because you know they're both. There's a structural element to both, if you will. So. Yeah, I, when it, yeah, you know, when you asked me the question earlier, what's one of my talents? It's relating things that seem to have no relationship. That's another one. <laughs> so I can, I can, I can make a relationship between just about anything. And what I see is that in your built in your in your business, pricing is a very structural element in that it kind of holds the building up to some context in some context from a profitability standpoint. And of course, and as a structural engineer, you're trying to figure out how to make sure that the building doesn't come down on people's heads. So in that context, I would say they're both very foundational things to what you're trying to achieve at the time. And if you take that out, if you don't have the engineer, if you don't have a good pricing strategy, then you know, you're kind of leaving things up to fate more than anything. Yeah. Absolutely. But how about then? I'm curious to hear more about your first steps as an entrepreneur, because you said you came to Switzerland when you, you had a job, you, you came with a company and you worked in pricing. But what made you take the plunge and uh, start your own business? Yeah. So when I when I first got my certification as a certified pricing professional, I realized I had literally stumbled into something that not many people specialize in. I think I was one of the first 40 or 50 people worldwide to get the CPP designation to earn it. You do have to go through coursework and and take a, a half day exam. I think it was at the time. Oh, wow. um, yeah, <laughs> I think my my study guide is still behind me here on the desk. Um, I realized that I had stumbled into something that not many people specialize in and that can bring enormous value to companies. And so for me, very early on after getting that CPP designation, I had the thought, you know, oh, this could be a business. I'm sure lots of companies need pricing specialists and don't have the resources to bring them in as, you know, full-time internal employees. So there's there's a space here for me. Uh, at the same time, I also knew that not a lot of companies or people knew that people like me existed. Um, so there was a hurdle there as well. So that was when I was still working uh, at Siemens at the time. And then an opportunity came up with a new company and it was a completely different industry than I'd ever worked for. And I thought, well, let's see if this pricing things translates. So in that time period, before I left the one company and went to the next, I actually wrote a business plan because I had already kind of started thinking that I may do something down the road. But then I went on to this new job and started it and um, really enjoyed working there uh, with the team. I learned a lot from my colleagues there. Uh, and then I unfortunately I went through a burnout. Yeah. Um, I started in, in the job where I was traveling 70% of the time and it took its toll on me. And, and one thing after another, all of a sudden there I was in, in this burnout situation. And when I was in the process of healing from that, I thought to myself, you know, what do I really want to do? And I really wanted to help more people. Um, and so I stood there for about a year and a half. I always talk about the cliff that I was stand toes over the edge, but not daring to step out as an entrepreneur myself. And there came a point in time where I either had to put that idea aside and just go get a job or step into it and give it my all. Um, and so I finally in, in August of 2017, uh, I, thought, okay, let's put your money where your mouth is, Liston, <laughs> <laughs> and and see what happens. Give it a try. So that was really, for me, it was a very scary decision um, from a financial perspective. Yeah. 
Absolutely, and well, I'm, I'm sure many of us can relate also to those uh, that wobbly, that wobbly feeling because it's yeah. it is a big decision from many many point of view, many points of view. But then I could also imagine that this experience it's been tremendously helpful w w in your work with your clients because you really understand what they are going through, especially mm -hmm. solo solo entrepreneurs, very small businesses, mm -hmm. very early stage businesses. So how has how has it impacted your work and the services you? deliver so i mean of course you know when you're an expert quote unquote expert in something um it doesn't mean that you don't make mistakes or that you even know everything i mean you know we like to think that doctors don't make mistakes but they're human beings they do as well um and there's always something new that we can learn and for me one of the things that i love about what i do but that's also you know, puts me outside my comfort zone at times, is that I understand the tactics and strategies of pricing. Are there more that I can learn? Absolutely. Um, but what I do is I help my clients understand how to utilize them in their business, in their industry. And every business and every industry is a little bit different. Um, so that enables me to, you know, to help them to see how to do it. Now, pricing to a certain extent is also somewhat trial and error. So you try, you, you use the best information you have to come up with a set of prices or a strategy or a tactic you want to use, and then you put it out there. And sometimes the assumptions that you make are not correct, or they change in the meantime, or something happens, and then it, it doesn't work. So you go back to the drawing board, you take what worked, you move on with something new and for something that didn't work, and you go forward. And I mean, I've done that in my business. Um, occasionally from time to time also in my own pricing. Um, and so I understand the um, discomfort that my clients have and feel um, in that context as well, because it feels like you should have, you know, a fixed answer, like there should be a number there that, that, that solves all your problems. But every situation is so different that, you know, it can't be actually I made a post this week. And it made me I don't know if you saw it falling of it, it made me laugh when I when it, the idea came to me, because it, almost every question that I get asked about pricing, the answer starts with, well, it depends on who your customer is. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I, I often start with it's not a one size fits all, but so to give you some uh, to give you some guidelines, I can, yeah, I can yeah, imagine yeah. it's the same same with pricing. So I mean, I've had to adjust my prices and and rethink things from time to time as well myself. Yeah. Are there some early lessons learned that you had to learn the hard way yourself when you were starting starting your own business, mm -hmm. or well later along the way? Yeah, I think probably my. I have a desire to understand things. So when I hire like support or somebody to help me with something, I like to understand it first before I bring them in. <laughs> and so for example, with my own website, uh, the first version of it, I did myself and I knew zero about building a website. And I went with WordPress um, instead of something like Squarespace or something like that, where it's a little bit more, um, let's say, um, you know, there's a lot of a lot more templates and things. It's it's I can't think of the word for it. It's just less customized, right? Um, and uh, so I think one of the lessons that I learned early on is I don't have to understand everything <laughs> in order to to get good help, right? Um, that I need to rely on on their expertise um, and let them, you know, sit and do their thing. I don't have to understand, you know all details and aspects of it. Do I regret doing what I did? No. Could I have gotten where I wanted to go faster if I had done it differently? Quite possibly, yeah. <laughs> and isn't it a situation with many, many early stage businesses with their pricing as well, that maybe the way to get there faster is actually to set up a proper strategy from the beginning instead of taking all the possible details and trying to understand every possible error of themselves? Yeah, yeah, I think that, um, no one says you have to work with a pricing expert, um, but what they can do is they can help you get there faster. And I think maybe even a bigger benefit in some contexts is that they can help you understand what to what 
what elements to use as part of the decision making process um, so that you're making the decisions you're making with better information. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's really important because it's easy to uh, to just not consider something. Yeah. A lot of my clients never really think about the value um, because they don't really know how. And quite frankly, nobody ever taught them how. Yeah. And so why would they? But if they do, then it changes their whole perspective on how they see their prices and what they can do with them. Absolutely. And like we discussed a little bit before we went live, that sometimes you just get so blind at your own stuff Mm -hmm. and things that are close to you, like your own business, uh, that having somebody external to help you through that thinking process can be really, really helpful. And we actually have a question from Megan, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. How does pricing strategy differ according to geography and culture? Or does pricing transcend geography and culture? Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, excellent question here. I'll post the question so people can read it. Um, This is a great question. Thank you for that, Megan. I think that, yes, it can affect your pricing strategy uh, because, quite frankly, Um, In some cultures or in some geographies, you will have, you know, different behavior with pricing. So, for example, um, in my corporate days, we did something very different with our pricing in a country like Italy uh, for our customer base and what we were offering, let me be clear, than we did in, you know, other parts of Europe, for example. And why? Well, there is a, you know, in this industry there, there was always very high discounts granted. So you have to change your approach. Uh, When I uh, worked, uh, let's see, uh, when I've worked in Asia, for example, you know, sometimes there's a lot of back and forth and negotiation. And we often knew that as soon as you gave them the first price, um, then you would start negotiating. And wherever you ended on that order, next time they ordered with you, that was the starting point for the negotiation of the next order, right? So you take those kinds of things into um, you know, the decision-making process around what you do and, and how you're going to interact. And one of the things that may surprise people is pricing is not just about setting the number, it's about all of your behavior, how you communicate that number, how you respond when people, uh, you know, uh, challenge you on it or ask for a discount, you know, all of those things play a part in it. And that's why things like geography and culture can have such a huge impact on your pricing strategy. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks for answering that. And thanks for the question, Megan. Mm-hmm. Now, next, I would like to dive a little bit deeper into the history of uh, the Pricing Lady, the podcast. Yes. So how did all that come about? <laughs> yeah. So I about a year after I started the business, uh, I was seeing that other people were being guests on podcast shows. And I thought, well, that sounds interesting. Uh, One of the things, you know, when it comes to having your own business, you're looking for ways, you know, things where you can get the biggest bang for your buck, so to speak, right? So in this case, the buck being my time and energy. Uh, And I thought podcast interviews are great. Uh, You know, the preparation is limited, the things that you need to do before and after, depending on how you do it, um, you know, can be very effective. And I went to a, I signed up for a course, uh, Profiting from Podcasts by Steve Ulsher. It's a great program. Uh, But I only wanted to do the part where I was a guest, not where I had my own podcast. And then I attended his new media summit, which is also a great program. And then I thought, well, maybe eventually I'll have a podcast. But I was very afraid of the amount of time it was going to take to edit things and promote things and whatever. So I started with what I jokingly call uh, a lazy girls podcast. (laughs) But really, I started with a YouTube live stream. Um, And for me, that was sort of a compromise. It didn't require me to do any editing. So I could use, you know, my time before and after more effectively. And I could still have a lot of content to reuse and repurpose. And uh, so that was where I started it. And I remember my first guest uh, on the show was, oh, no, now I'm blanking on her name. 
um, Spanish lady. Her name will come to me in a minute. Um, and I did my first live stream ever. I was terribly nervous about it when I did it because, you know, I just didn't know what was going to happen. And I think we live streamed on the Facebook and YouTube at the time. And partway through her, her camera video connection just stopped. And uh, we don't know why to this day, but for about two thirds of the interview, you can only hear her. So as we were live streaming and didn't have a podcast version, um, of course, I had to put all kinds of notes here and there about, okay, we had a technical difficulty. So you'll still hear her just fine, but you won't be able to see her. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, we started off with a bang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, you just said uh, you were diving straight into the deep end, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we will. And that's part of my personality as well is to just give it a whirl. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, now 100 podcasts later, 54 mm -hmm. guests, over 3,500 episodes downloaded. Was it, has it been like you imagined it to begin with? It's funny. I'm not sure. Did I have like... um an image of what it would look like. And I'm not sure. I think that one of the things that I've gotten the most out of it has been the network between um, the people who I've had on my show, but also guesting on other shows. So just that whole podcasting community, um, that has been brilliant. Um, and I really appreciate the time that my guests give to myself and my community. Um, and the, the candor, the authenticity that they have, you know, in sharing something that isn't necessarily always so comfortable to share. You know, um, I, you know, I know when I, I do pre-calls with people, not to, you know, rehearse the interview, but to make sure that people are comfortable speaking about a money topic, because most people feel a little bit on edge talking about money. Absolutely. And it's also, I can imagine it's not always very easy on the production end of things necessarily, but that's something that also makes your podcast a little bit different and so refreshing because mm -hmm. it's also a topic where it might be hard to find information at times. And mm -hmm. maybe it's also one reason why people don't know that people like you exist because we don't talk about money or prices yeah. so much or as much as maybe other, other aspects or business, things mm -hmm. like marketing, communications, even business planning strategy. There's a lot mm -hmm. of around that funding but then when you talk about the other end of money things uh, prices and the profitability it's maybe a little bit uh, forgotten of or not speaking speaking about at least yeah I think it's one of those things that you know people feel it's a little bit taboo in some in some contexts you know um, and, you know like I hear from a lot of my my clients they're like oh I can't charge more I don't want to be seen as greedy so there's a lot of core beliefs and hang-ups around around money especially um, and that makes it a little bit less um, it's a topic that, you know, people feel less comfort, you know, speaking about publicly. But what I can say is that, you know, for a lot of the, the episodes, the ones that um, I think resonate with people the most when I have guests on are the ones where people are very candid about their experience and the mistakes that they made. Um, and I think, and the reason for that is because one, we can all identify with it. Yeah, you know, we've all made made mistakes one way or another for sure. Um, and hearing that other people have done that, it helps us um, to not feel so alone. But then also the second step, of course, is we can learn from what they did and or what they might have done differently. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And that's how we all benefit. And you really interviewed a wide range of experts and entrepreneurs from service based mm -hmm. businesses to ap applications, yeah. uh, consultants, uh, product businesses. Has there been among all those people, has there been maybe one or two interviewees that have really stuck with you or that you think of fondly to this day? Yeah. So I hate to choose just one. <laughs> I'm sure we can, as a disclaimer, we can say that you've absolutely loved everybody. And I'm sure your yeah. listeners have, have, have yeah, as well. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> excuse me. 
So um, I've really enjoyed all of them. I think the one that I come back to uh, quite often is my interview with Joy Foster from Tech Pixies. Um, in terms of like the stage of her business and the different stages that she's gone through, I think she's um, kind of had um, one of the bigger transitions in her business. I think her business is a uh, multi-million dollar now or pound. I'm, I'm not sure which, um, but uh, you know, and she really, you know, started from, from, from the, the base up and what, what resonated so much with me is this, this idea that your mindset is everything. And, and she, you know, she shared that, you know, she just, looked at it all wrong. Um, and then when she had to start making changes with things, she made the change and then she realized, okay, I did this first step. Now I need to do the second step. Um, and she talked about how she was able to make each step and each step gave her the courage then to make the next one. Um, and a lot of my guests, not just Joy, but many of my guests have talked about their their own mindset and how that has helped and hindered them along the way. When I talk that, I, I think of Bob McIntosh, the interview with him. Uh, we talked a lot about mindset as well. And so I think that this is for not just in the context of pricing, but in the context of having your own business, mindset is key. And there are times when you're just like, on mindset, right? You're <laughs> just like, I don't want to have a good mindset. Leave me alone. <laughs> I just want to do the work and succeed. Yeah, I'm tired of doing all this work on my mindset. <laughs> um, but you know, and so it's it's valleys and hills. And I think I've said this um, before many times, but it bears repeating: starting your own business, um, starting a podcast starting your own mentorship program, you know, doing just about anything, but definitely starting your own business. I thought it was a career journey. I thought it was about me and my career. What I didn't realize when I started was that it's actually a personal development journey more than anything else. Um, and those are difficult. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And that's also, uh, that's why it's so great to open up these different sides of entrepreneurship, because yeah. it can look like I said, said, said in the beginning, it sometimes you look at others, and it seems so glossy and perfect. But you just don't know all the steps that they have taken on the background. Yeah. And that's why it's also so great to hear about your journey and all the yeah. steps and all the hard work that, work yeah. that you put in. Yeah. How about still on the topics of your interviews and your mm -hmm. podcast podcast guests? Have has there maybe been an episode or a topic that taught a lot for you? That you taught you learned something new about, mm. either about pricing or something else in business or life. Oh shoot, I'm having troubles coming up with one in my mind. I, well, I think um, I've had a couple of branding experts on the show. And um, it's easy to forget the relationship between pricing and branding. Um, but, you know, through the conversations with them, you know, I came back to this and, and started to understand um, different aspects of, of branding and how it relates to what you're doing and how important it is in your pricing and what's, What's really important also in this context is right now there are a lot of businesses. I work with a lot of clients who have sustainability based businesses. And when it comes to your pricing strategy, what you choose to do with your prices, you also need to make sure it's aligned with your brand, including your mission, your values. You know, all of those things have to be in alignment to, to get the most out of it. Um, and I think you know, having those conversations with them was kind of like an aha for me and that, oh yeah, this is really important that people, especially in these sustainability businesses, um, understand how their vision, vision, mission, and values, how those relate to what they need to do with your price, with their pricing. So for example, if one of your values is transparency, then you would want to make sure that you carry that through in some context, you carry that through into your pricing strategy as well. 
And, and that's really, really important. So that that was one thing that definitely comes to mind is the discussions I had with them. And I think collectively, when I look back at, you know, across all the different topics that we had, because when I first started the show, um, I had three different kinds of guests, if you will, quote, unquote, I had um, people who sharing their pricing journey, I had experts in topics related to pricing. And I had um, people who wanted to do some one to one coaching live, right. So we had three different things. But what was interesting to me is to see how, you know, the relationship between all of these different topics, and pricing. Um, I like making things relate. I think I said that before. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But but the long, longer I speak with you, the more I learn about pricing, the clearer it gets that mm. pricing is not an isolated part of business or anything. But it's it's it it really it it really uh, impacts and is linked to every other aspect of your business, from really the branding and the creative part to the products and services themselves, to to profits, to um, relationships. To your with body clients. language. Yeah, your body language, the way that you respond to things, the way you introduce yourself. It's it's there's there's so many different aspects that influence it um, and that are influenced by it. Yeah. So it goes in both directions. Um, and that's one of the reasons why when I when I talk to people, especially do introductory pricing sessions with, you know, different groups of people, I always talk about how pricing is not an activity that you're doing once or twice, it's actually a way of being or behaving in your business, because it's actually a way of thinking. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that's super interesting. That actually uh, leads me to my next question, mm -hmm. because I've, I've been listening to your podcast for a while, and I enjoy your solo casts a lot as well, in addition to the interviews. And I've been admiring your talent in public speaking. So where does that come from? And a double question, where does that come from? And how much you actually, well, think that pricing is affected and impacted by how you conduct yourself mm -hmm. and these mm -hmm. kind of technical things that I don't maybe you don't think about when you think about pricing in the first place yeah oh I love I love this question uh so I am um, I am not active right now but I've been a Toastmaster I think I started in 2005 with Toastmasters for those of you who don't know Toastmasters it's a uh club if you will a large, very large club, global club, um, to help people develop communication and leadership skills. Um, here in Basel, where I am, I think we have about eight or 10 clubs still. Um, so it's, it's quite, quite large. I think last time, um, I'm not going to come up with the numbers because it's been a while since I looked, so I don't know, but I think there were about two or 3000, um, um, clubs worldwide. No, there must be more than that. Um, so, Obviously, I can't remember the numbers, but it's a very large organization. And I had a not so great relationship in the past with public speaking, um, having run off the stage and crying in front of 100 people <laughs> when I was I in the early that. 20s. <laughs> So I had done it after that, but never really enjoyed it. And I always envied those people who were up on stage and looked like they were having fun. So when I joined Toastmasters, my my goal, my whole, the whole purpose for doing it was simply to enjoy public speaking, to have fun in it. Uh, and I did, I really leaned right into it. I, my first speech there, my icebreaker speech, um, for those of you who don't know Toastmasters, the icebreaker is the first speech and you're just supposed to introduce yourself. It's five to six minutes long. And uh, I was so nervous. I couldn't control the pitch of my voice. I sounded like a, a teenage boy. <laughs> just cracked and, and it went all over the place, but I just powered through and delivered. And uh, the title of this piece was who uh, intrepid who me. And I had asked uh, friends and colleagues across the globe to send me uh, one word they would use to describe me. And I used that as fodder for creating the speech. And I got three people in different parts of the world wrote back with the word intrepid and I didn't even know what it meant. <laughs> So intrepid is re relentless in the pursuit of something. Um, and that was where, where I started. And then uh, in 2012, I was the European humor speech champion, 
with my speech, Caveman 2.0, uh, which you can still find today on YouTube. So we'll, we'll put that in the show notes for you. Um, so yes, I have a, a rich background in public speaking and I really love doing it. Yeah, I mean, that was a long way to get to the point there, uh, but I really enjoy doing it. And it has absolutely helped me in my business. I think it also helps in, in your pricing. And, you know, there's two aspects in, in the Toastmasters journey um, when it comes to the communication part. And one is prepared speeches and the other is impromptu speaking. Yes, you can practice impromptu speaking. And I think that, that having that skill of also being able to answer questions when people ask you questions um, that you're not prepared for, or even sometimes when you are prepared for them, uh, being able to speak in a coherent way and be able to get to the point and get your message across is a skill that's helped me in my business, in my podcast, and in, in every aspect of life. Absolutely. And when it comes to pricing, I think people underestimate the impact of their communication. So the way in which you introduce yourself when you meet someone new, you're at a networking event, let's say you're uh, an NLP coach, somebody asks you what you do, and you say, I'm, I'm just a coach. Or you say, I'm an NLP coach and I do blah, 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 and blah, 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 and blah, 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 and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. You know, they list like a huge list of all the things that they do. You know, those things have a huge impact on the first perception that people have of you. And if you can elevate that perception that they have from the first moment you speak with them, then you're already you know, taking them down the path to potentially being someone that is a partner or a, uh, a client or some other working with you in some other context is absolutely important. Do you practice impromptu pricing questions with your clients like rapid fire? Can you give me, give me a discount? No. I try to, but they're not always excited to do it. And I don't understand why. <laughs> Yeah, because that, that's kind of practice you might need because often those questions, well, not necessarily about discounts or not only about discounts, they can come very quickly. Yes. And if you're not prepared, there's a high risk that you will say something stupid like, yeah, of course I do all that extra stuff or I can do this in two days or whatever it is. So I, I, I encourage and have used that with my clients when it comes to introducing themselves. You know, I, I'm Janine. Uh, what do you do, Paulina? And then you answer. And the first time we have a giggle because you mess it up. And then I do it again and I do it again. And then once you're comfortable, then I change and move to the next question, which throws you off your cane. And so we, <laughs> right? But that sort of preparation, whether it comes to, you know, stating your price with a customer, handling a pricing objection, just having the sales discussion being prepared in that way, it, it actually, here's what it does is when you get an unexpected question, it triggers most people into a fight, flight, or freeze mode to varying degrees. It can be very, very slight, but when that happens, uh, then, you know, a certain part of your brain, the cognitive part, isn't functioning as well as it should. And so if you've practiced that, then you kind of have this instinct for a response. Whereas if you haven't practiced it, then you're trying to make something up on the fly. And we all know what happens when you make stuff up on the fly. It doesn't usually go as well as it could, right? So I encourage my clients constantly to, in some of these contexts, to practice things. Also, um, I have a, a program on how to do customer insight interviews. Um, and we do mock interviews as a, as a, as a part of that, that course. And it's so important because then you can work out some of the kinks before you're actually doing it with an actual potential client. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's really useful. And that's, that's a good tip for everybody. Yes. Well, we've covered a lot. We talk about the psychology of pricing, the engineering uh, of, of pricing, as well as, as the confidence and practice. Mm -hmm. But if you now, now that you look, at, look back at all the podcast episodes, is there one that you would want everybody to listen to? If, if somebody is listening for us for the first time now, what is the episode they should tune in to next? Mm, it really depends on what they want, you know, where their questions lie. Um, I think if if mindset is your struggle, 
um, listen to Joy's episode. Um, poor Joy. She, <laughs> her episode <laughs> is one that I recommend a lot because I think that she leads by great example. Um, I think that the solo cast episodes are really great because they're a bit more educational. Um, so we focus on topics like um, your nasty little discounting habit, yeah, um, which a lot of people underestimate the impact discounting has on their business, the negative impact that it has on their business. Uh, or, as, you know, because a lot of uh, people that I work with are, are service-based businesses. So also understanding that, you know, time-based, the pros and cons of time-based pricing. Uh, I think the episode is called... Um, Time is just the wrapper your services are delivered in. Uh, so that's a really good one. But this is why I say, you know, it really depends on you know what aspect of pricing that you're struggling with the most um, that will help you. Uh, the last one I would recommend is I have one on value. I can't remember the, ah, yes, it was something along the lines. We'll put these in the, in the notes for everyone so they have quick links to them. But there's one on, um, I know I should price price based on value, but what does that mean? <laughs> that sounds, sounds like yeah. a bestseller off the bat. <laughs> yeah, that's probably a, you know, one that's, that covers a topic that most people miss when it comes to their pricing. They don't even realize that they should be thinking about it, but that's like so important to finding the right prices, especially for your small businesses. Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing all those tips. So it wasn't uh, one. <laughs> It's it's okay. It's always okay to give it give a few. So there's something for everybody. Yeah. How about going forward? When you look at the next 100 episodes of uh, Live with the Pricing Lady, what are your thoughts? Where are you going next? Yeah. So I did have a plan for this year, but we didn't quite get it off the ground as I I want. And I'm looking at it again for next year. And that's having say like a quarterly panel discussion. I love the format of a panel discussion. I think it's really engaging both for the people participating as well as listeners. Uh, and uh, weirdly enough, uh, the reason it didn't get off the ground was simply due to time zone issues. Because <laughs> I had the panel set up, but we had one person in the UK, one person in the US, me here, and somebody in Australia. And it was just it just didn't didn't quite work out. Um, but I'd like to to bring that into the mix because then we can have, you know, there's lots of different ways to approach things in your business, including your pricing. Um, Time-based pricing, it works very well for some people. Um, but for a lot of businesses, this is not the best way to do it, but it's the easiest way to do it. Yeah. Um, and so we could have, you know, more, and I don't want to say a debate, but we could have certainly a, a nice discussion about different strategies and tactics um, when we have people with different perspectives there. So that's one thing that um, has intrigued me um, and I'd like to try out. But of course, you know, that's starting right. up getting one guest on the show, organizing a, a handful of them at one time is is even a, a little bit trickier, but uh, I'm I'm up to the challenge. So that's one thing. I've also, there's two other things I'd like to mention. One is I'd like to get a little bit more diversity in some of the guests that I've had on the show. So more product-based businesses, um, also maybe people who have bigger businesses where they have employees. And so we can talk about different aspects, um, you know, that influence pricing that, you know, things that are different than people with, you know, a business that has one or five or 10 people. So I think that would be very interesting. And I'd like to get, you know, some more people like Joy who are further along in the journey or who have, you know, more experience in different areas of pricing in their business to come on the show and share those journeys with us. Yeah, yeah it sounds, sounds like a great way to highlight the different aspects of pricing and how it changes and evolves with your business as well. Yeah. How about, is there a dream guest that you would have, like to have on the show if you could pick anybody on the planet? <laughs> There's so many. I mean, 
I mean, whenever somebody asks me, is there somebody that you would love to talk to? Um, it's the There's always one person who comes to the top of the list and that's Oprah Winfrey because I just, there's just so much to love about her. Um, I'd, I'd be curious about her own pricing journey in, in some ways, but also from a mindset perspective, I think she has so much to share with everybody. But then there's also, you know, the the icons in in our industry, if you will. So, you know, people like Marie Forleo or Amy Porterfield and, you know, how they really approach this topic in the very early stages of the business and what worked, what didn't, I'm sure people would love to hear those things. And it would be my great pleasure to have people like that on the show as well. Yeah, absolutely. I look forward to those episodes. And if Oprah, Amy or Marie are listening, <laughs> you know where to find Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess the time is coming to wrap up. Mm -hmm. And again, to honor your great uh, podcast format and live show format, I would like to uh, wrap up with some rapid fire questions again, okay. which I've shamelessly stolen from you. <laughs> because uh, <clears throat> you have such a good such a good format. So one thing that people should or you would want people to take from this discussion about pricing, podcasting and business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's important, uh, as we said at the beginning, to remember that, you know, everybody's journey is their own journey. And what we see uh, as, you know, say a pillar of success, um, most likely didn't happen overnight, and that we can learn a lot from each other's experiences, um, both in the context of what to do and what not to do. Uh, and so I think that, you know, learning from podcasts, learning from uh, other people in your industry is a very important part of any endeavor, but certainly when you're starting your own business. Absolutely. How about a favorite book or tool that you would like to share with others? Oh, gosh, there's so many. I think one of my favorite books and that I recommend all the time is a book by a lady named Tara Mar Moore, who could also come on the show as a guest. <laughs> um, uh, she wrote a book called Playing Big. And over the years, I've run book groups on this book, and I still refer to it all the time. The book is geared towards women, but also totally suitable for men as well. And it's actually it's about how women can play bigger. And the reason I say it's suitable for men is they have some of the same challenges, of course, but also, you know, it's their support often that women need as well in order to achieve playing bigger in, in some context. Um, and there's, there's, you know, very personal and private parts to it um, about say fear, you know, two different kinds of fear, Pashad and Yura, which I, I love these two different images of fear we have, but there's also like a list of words, you know, that are diminishing words, words that we use that diminish our vocabulary. Like the example before, I'm just a coach is much less powerful than saying I'm a coach. Yeah. And so she has this lovely whisk list of diminishing words. Lovely may not be quite be the right term for it. Cool. You know, <laughs> words that diminish our communication. So it's a book I highly recommend. Uh, and uh, Tara's, I've also done Tara's program. It's super, it's excellent as well. So playing big by Tara Moore, we'll put that in the show notes tools that I love. There's so many of them. But my newest favorite tool is Tolstoy. Uh, it's for doing videos. And um, they're actually interactive kind of videos where you can have little buttons for people to communicate and leave you messages back, or you can send them to landing pages and whatever. It's a really nice tool and a good way to communicate with people. So and check out the Tolstoy app. Perfect. Thanks for sharing those. And mm -hmm. finally, what is the best best business advice that you've been given? Oh, the best business advice I've been given is not to do it alone. Yeah, hands down. Yeah, use your community. And I think, I, you know, the interesting part of that is also to remember that um, I think we've all probably heard this from time to time that when you start your own business, uh, that, you know, and it's nothing against people who don't have businesses, right? But they think differently. 
Um, and so, you know, you have to find your community and the people who you support and they support you. And quite often it's a different community than maybe you've spent time with before. And so it's very important not to try and do it alone. That's, that's very, very country. true. Yeah. And from, from your community, you can find the best tips for, well, service providers, podcasts, yeah. anything that you need to. to Thursday <laughs> virtual co-working with the pricing lady. <laughs> Definitely. So you can we keep just rebranded it this. to uh, get shit done Thursdays. <laughs> That's not bad. That's not bad. I might join that. <laughs> Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much, Janine, for answering all my questions. I know there were plenty. I, I studied journalism and I tended to say that I have a master's degree in asking stupid questions. So that's uh, it was really fun to have a full hour to do that today. Thank you so much for playing along. And thank you, everybody who was listening and sending questions as well. And I'll hand back to Janine to wrap up. Well, thank you, Paulina. I really appreciate you agreeing to come on the show and turn the tables on me. And you were the first person I thought of when, when the opportunity came up. So thank you very much. And thank you to all of you who have been following me uh, for the past three years, who have been watching the show and will continue to in the future. And for those of you who were here with us live today, thank you very much for joining us for your support and your questions. Now, if any of you have more questions about uh, pricing in your business, you can always find me at thepricinglady.com. And if you go to book a call there, you'll be able to book a call with me and we can talk more about what's going on in your world. Thank you so much, everyone. I wish you all the best. We'll keep bringing you more and more episodes in the future. But until then, enjoy pricing, everyone. Bye. <laughs>